Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Yes, great. So I also see you. Uh, yeah, I see some of you. Okay, perfect. So um, as I said, and as you uh, presented, Amina, uh, my talk today is From Words to Voids, Absencing and Haunting in Crimean Semiotic Landscapes. So usually I'm affiliated with Stockholm University in Sweden, but at the moment, I am in Luleå. As you can see, this is quite in the north of Sweden. It's about 900 kilometers away from Stockholm and about 15,000 kilometers from the Western Cape. As you can see, the weather here is quite chilly, so I'm not really looking forward to go outside. Uh, during this talk, uh, I will try to guide you through the time of my PhD, starting from fall 2017, when I conducted my first uh, fieldwork um, uh, field in Sevastopol, up until today. So I'm going to give you an overview of my thesis. I will situate it historically, politically, and sociolinguistically, discuss some theoretical foundations, introduce you to the fieldwork sites and to my data collection methods, uh, provide an overview of four studies which comprise my PhD thesis, and conclude with discussing a range of contributions with which I uh, suggest uh, for the field of semiotic landscapes. All right, so first of all, why Crimea? Uh, some of you may know that I was born in Kherson, this region neighboring uh, on Crimea in the south. Uh, I was finishing my bachelor degree at the university in Kherson in 2013, so 10 years ago, as the Euromaidan protests broke out. Then the Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych refused to sign the association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine, which is why mass demonstrations erupted all over the country. I remember that all of a sudden, everyone started talking about language. Usually in Ukraine, issues of language would be mobilized during national election campaigns. Some candidates for presidency, for example, would capitalize on people's alleged language sentiments leaning towards Russian in the East and Ukrainian in the West of the country. However, at times of the Euromaidan protests, and after the subsequent annexation of Crimea in March 2014, language was shown to be involved in the justification of crimes on a much bigger scale. For example, Putin's claim to protect Crimea and the Russian speakers there was said to be among the main reasons for his territorial violation. When I moved from Ukraine to Switzerland to continue my studies, also in 2014, I received a very peculiar photograph from a friend. This one. Um, this photograph depicted a newly installed billboard placed in between my town Kherson and the Crimean Peninsula. This billboard addressed the travelers arriving from Crimea in two languages, on the left in, on Ukraine, in Ukrainian and in Russian on the right. The intended reader, it seemed, could not be speaking both languages at the same time. First, from the left, um, the message written in Ukrainian was meant to sound welcoming and caring. Uh, the message pathetically read, Brothers, Ukrainians from Crimea, although you are under Russian occupation, we always look forward to seeing you. Europe opens the doors for you. Get your biometric passports and travel freely in the civilized world. Happiness be with you. This text implied the reason for traveling from Crimea to receive a newly issued type of the Ukrainian biometric passport, which after April 2017 enabled every Ukrainian citizen to travel to the countries of the European Union without a visa. However, the text on the billboard, as you remember, also contained Russian inscriptions, 
this time conveying a completely different picture. It read, traitors and collaborators, why did you come for Ukrainian passport? Do you want to go to Europe? Aren't you no longer interested in the tours around the Golden Ring? This is the Golden Ring. As you see, this is the tour offered in uh, Russia uh, across the, uh, the towns around Moscow. So the message continues, stay at home and wait for the stones from heaven. You have no business here. Nothing but hatred, it seemed, could come from the Russian-speaking sympathizer and traitor. This instance, however singular, showed me that language mattered. Also, it showed that public space could be easily transformed into the space of accommodating antagonistic messages, conveying love and support for one group of speakers and discriminating others. It showed that based on individual's language preferences, one could be associated and even accused in political stances one has never taken. For me, this billboard was the reason why I wanted to go to Crimea and see what was going on there. So before I turn to the core of my thesis, let me first situate my research in a historical, political, and social linguistic context. All of these studies take place in Crimea, the Autonomous Republic. As all of you well know, in March 2014, followed by an invasion of so-called Little Green Men, little, uh, later identified as Russian soldiers, the Ukrainian critical infrastructure and lines of communication in Crimea were occupied. Later guarded by heavily armed Russian troops, a disputed referendum was carried out. During the referendum, the residents of Crimea could decide whether they wanted to stay within Ukraine or join the Russian Federation. It appeared as no surprise that the illegal referendum was claimed to result in nearly univocal support for Crimea's accession to Russia, as you can see, almost 97%. As it stands, since 16 March 2014, it has been de facto incorporated into Russia in what is viewed as annexation by most countries and deemed illegal by Euro uh, Ukrainian law and the United Nations General Assembly Resolution. Immediately after the annexation of Crimea, uh, Crimea was about to undergo a so-called transition. In other words, it meant that Crimea was to be incorporated into the Russian economic, financial, and legal systems. In practical terms, it meant that, for instance, Russian currency ruble was introduced, all Ukrainian enterprises and their properties changed the owners, Russian banks and the Russian subsidiary companies started their operation. Of course, such developments had an undeniable impact on the public space of Crimea. As I have shown to you in my introduction, and also as I will be showing particularly in study one and study four, the walls of the Crimean towns, cities, villages, and settlements were adorned with identification marks of Russian governmental organizations, civil initiatives, youth movements, and political leaders. Given that language has played a pivotal role in this conflict, let's have a closer look at the ethnic and linguistic composition of Crimea. Based on the latest but slightly outdated population census conducted in 2001, Crimea is the only region in Ukraine where ethnic Russians constitute a majority of the population, almost 60%. This majority is followed second by Ukrainians, uh, by Ukrainians who constitute almost a quarter, 25% of the Crimea's population, and lastly by the third Crimean Tatar ethnic group, constituting 12% of the population. Out of the total population of the Republic of Crimea, 77% consider Russian to be their native language, whereas about 11.5% consider Crimean Tatar to be their native language. And lastly, 10% of the population considered Ukrainian to be their native language. Now, within these ethnic groups, 
96% of those who self-identified as ethnic Russians considered Russian to be their native language. Accordingly, 92% of those who self-identified as Crimean Tatars consider Crimean Tatar to be the native language, and 85% uh, consider of those who identified um, as Ukrainian consider Ukrainian to be the native language. So we have these numbers here. However, we have to treat them with caution. Of course, um, both spoken languages and ethnicities were measured based on the undocumented self-perceptions of the survey respondents. Second, if even if 92% of Crimean Tatars claimed Crimean Tatar to be their native language, it did not really mean that they speak Crimean Tatar in their everyday lives. Given the fact that all Crimean Tatars were deported from Crimea in the end of um, uh, in 1940s, um, they became predominantly Russian speakers. So the actual percentage of those who can actually speak Crimean Tatar is very low. Uh, and with the vast majority of um, people knowing only a few expressions such as greetings or very um, everyday collocations. And finally, uh, similarly to reports uh, by Ukrainians uh, who claim to speak Ukrainian as their native language, falls short at capturing their actual preference to speak Russian on a day-to-day -day basis. Though today this is changing, of course, due to the war, and we have ongoing research that shows that many Ukrainians actually switch uh, to uh, Ukrainian from Russian to um, show their affiliations with the Ukrainian state or to show the, um, uh, to show the, the disalignment, so to say. All right, so to come back, the last uh, word on this population census, um, we can say that the census, this information offers us only an orientation as it is impossible to infer certain meanings people attach to questions being asked in these surveys or to know the motivations in providing certain responses. It is hard to know what such social categories as nationality, ethnicity, and native language as they use it really mean for the individual speakers. We don't know if these are reflections of their everyday practices or their rather desired identifications. And this point brings me to the next theoretical section of my study, of my talk. So in my thesis, I say that I conduct an ethnographically tuned semiotic, landscapes, uh, semiotic landscape research in contemporary Crimea. What does it really mean? On the one hand, I orient towards the tenets of linguistic ethnography, which following Himes and further developed by Rampton, is known to commit to the following two principles. First, that the context of communication should be investigated and not just assumed. Meaning takes shape among agents with different repertoires and expectations in specific social relations, interactional histories, and institutional regimes, and these need to be grasped ethnographically. The second principle is biography, identifications, stance, and nuance are extensively signaled in the textual fine grain, so analysis of the internal organization of verbal data reveals much of their position and significance in the world. What is ethnography? In his book, Ethnography, Linguistics, Narrated Inequality, Himes admits the difficulty in defining ethnography. Broadly speaking, ethnography is associated with the study of people not ourselves and with the use of methods other than those of experimental design and quantitative measurement. What ethnography is and is not remains difficult to define, however, central to ethnography are systematic participation and observation. Systematic may mean comprehensive, it is a documentation and interpretation of a wide range of a way of life. In words of Julia Snell, Sarah Shaw, and Fiona Kuplan, 
the systematicity of investigation could be understood through an inquiry into different kinds of data or different kinds of analysis through a variety of analytic traditions, such as conversation analysis, textual analysis, quantitative variation analysis, in combination with ethnography. It is at this point of my presentation when I want to introduce the semiotic landscapes lens, which I utilize in my thesis. Semiotic landscapes um, or linguistic landscapes is a field of study initially defined by Laundrie and Boris as the visibility and silence of languages on public and commercial sites in a given territory or region. To be even more specific about the kinds of data and the kinds of science that can be used, let's have a look at the extended description by Martin Putz and Neil Mundt. They say that all data in principle can be found across all physical spaces where people leave visible and nonverbal signs which all communicate meanings and intentions in one way or another. Examples include signposts, photographs and videos, billboards, public roads and safety signs, slogans and commercials, lighting and printed materials, names of buildings, streets, shops and areas of major tourist attractions, instructions, warning, no warning notices and prohibitions, graffiti, tattoos, in short, live documentations and reflections of the physical environment of the late modern globalized urban space. So as one can see from these two descriptions, right, this one and this one, uh, the primary interest in visible and verbal and nonverbal signs remained since the first uh, definition was coined by Laundrie and Boris. Even though later research has broadened the meaning of linguistic in linguistic landscapes to also include smell, touch, taste, and hearing, the primary concern with linguistic representation, visibility, and visuality largely persisted. In my work, for the sake of consistency, I will refer to semiotic landscapes rather than linguistic landscapes as a way to foreground other forms of semiosis that go beyond strictly linguistic elements of landscapes. But, but why the interest in landscapes? Why landscapes? In what Stratum Pendukana call material ethnography of multilingualism, they identify landscapes as a resource for the study of social circulation of meaning in society. Similarly, Blumert in his book, Language Superdiversity and Linguistic Landscapes, attests that physical space is also social, cultural, and political. A space that offers, enables, triggers, invites, prescribes, proscribes, polices. A space that is never no man's land, but always somebody's space. A space of power controlled by, as well as controlling people. This quote shows that semiotic and linguistic landscapes are intricately tied uh, tied to, shaped by, and also shaping people's activities. But again, what do we know about um, human experience when looking at those definitions? We can directly or indirectly infer information about human actions when, for example, observing a defacement of one sign or reinstallment of another sign. However, how can we explore place and its interconnections with individual subjectivities, memories, and bodies? And here I turn to Jeff Malpa's work, as uh, Amina and Quentin do in their edited volume on making sense of people and places. Uh, so Jeff Malpa's work offers, I believe, a productive lens to study place and people and commonality rather than as two discrete entities. Instead of treating place as such in which individuals dwell, some sort of container, Malpa's in opposition views place as integral to the very structure and possibility of human experience. 
That is why I approach semiotic landscapes in commonality with individual experiences rather than, as a dimension, abstracted from the self. And for example, to give you a good sense of how the person is sort of can be absorbed in the environment without us noticing this um, interconnection, we can have this metaphor, the invisible man, uh, the painting which uh, showcases us how, how one can disappear in surroundings in an effort to deeply probe the, con probe the connection between people and place. So to summarize, uh, taken together the linguistic ethnographic tenets, the semiotic landscapes research, which treats landscapes as resources for the study of social life in combination with the approach to place as inseparable from human experience, allows me the pursuit of the main theme in my thesis, an exploration of absence in semiotic landscapes. Moving on, I would like to introduce you to the sites of my fieldwork and my data collection methods. So the first three-day field trip to Crimea took place in November 2017. During this trip, I took around 200 photographs, um, especially in Sevastopol, as you can see here. Later, when I conducted my second field trip between September and October 2019, I took more than three and a half thousand photographs, spoke with 35 participants, conducted six walking tours, uh, 11 audio recordings, uh, four focus group discussions. I also, of course, made field notes and kept a detailed uh, fieldwork diary. With and without my participants, I visited Simferopol. Here, Simferopol, the capital of Crimea, Vakhtisaray, here, Yevpatoria, Popovka, Yalta. Um, as a holder of a Ukrainian passport, the indication of my residency in the adjacent Ukrainian town of Kherson allowed me to easily move across newly erected borders and remain largely invisible. During my stay in Crimea, I sought to affiliate myself with one of the educational institutions. I volunteered to be a language assistant. I contacted a Crimean colleague who later put me in touch with the scholars in Crimea supporting my research. After all, their assistance and hospitality during my stay, as well as my assigned position as a language assistant and a visiting PhD student were decisive for the completion of my project. As I had been told from the start, due to the banning of visitors from abroad and international exchanges being put on hold, other international guests, guests like myself avoided Crimea as a no-go zone due to the Russian annexation and complicated legal matters. For the two months of my stay, I became a fully-fledged member of the team, which came together with an immense sense of freedom. For instance, I could deputize for other teachers and was free to, des uh, to design the content of my classes. I could give lectures, take charge of student discussion groups, and lead language clubs. Once I got to know the students better, I could recruit them as participants for my project. Some of the students agreed to be interviewed, to give a tour in an area of their choice, while some shared insights by showing me their photographs and observations of interesting landscapes. During our meetings, we spoke English, German, and Russian. Now at times, uh, my Russian was rather poor, even though that's my first language. Uh, as it increasingly became a language I would translate into from English or German, I was uncomfortable expressing my thoughts in Russian all the time. Besides, I lacked a Crimean regional identity and had no personal ties with the, uh, with the peninsula. Based on students' questions, they asked me, such as the questions about the main difficulties and problems learning foreign languages, about my preferred country of residence, about my reasons for taking a PhD, one could say that they perceived me as possessing different forms of capital. This mix of, identi mix of identities and resources 
together with my position in Simferopol as a newcomer, and not least the fact that I was a female in my 20s, allowed me to quickly develop a good rapport with my participants. I began my field work by asking these guiding research questions. First, how can semiotic landscapes in Crimea be described? Second, if there are signs of change, how are they made visible in semiotic landscapes? And finally, if there have been any changes, what has been the response to them? At the end of my fieldwork and prior to the writing of each individual study, the research questions were specified and reformulated into one research question. In what ways can the study of absence in semiotic landscapes offer another lens for approaching social practice in its material discursive complexity and as it relates to the world beyond? In the following section, I briefly present the contributions of each of the papers and emphasize how each of them adds to the exploration of absencing and haunting in Crimean semiotic landscapes. So here are the four studies which comprise the thesis. First, still Ukrainian or already Russian, the linguistic landscape of Sevastopol in the aftermath of Crimean annexation. Second, our nation is just trying to rebirth right now, constructing Crimean data spaces of otherwise through linguistic citizenship. Third, maneuvers of dissent in landscapes of annexation, and finally, shouting absences, disentangling the ghosts of Ukraine in occupied Crimea. Study one asks in what ways were the visual representations of discourses about Russian nation and nationalism materialized as they circulated in the public space of the city Sevastopol. This first study departs from, uh, from an exploration of the glorious city uh, Sevastopol, whose legacy can be traced back to 18th century Crimea, then occupied by the Russian Empire. The study presents an analysis of the fieldwork data collected in 2017, and it explores what could be called dominant or qualified knowledge by investigating emplacement and modalities of various types of signs, such as street names, place names, advertisements, graffiti, and billboards. According to Scolan and Scolan, Emplacement means that all semiotic signs have a significant part of their meaning in how they are placed in the world. Given the premise that Crimea is a Ukrainian territory, it seems straightforward that in a, in a Ukrainian place, you would not encounter the officially sa sanctioned signature of the Russian state authorities, such as the Russian Pension Fund or the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation. Similarly, it would be unlikely to see explicit or implicit messages of Russian ownership of territory or Russian flags attached to every corner. In other words, the presence of semiotic landscapes indexing Russian affiliations, both covertly and overtly, can unquestionably be regarded as a real threat to the territorial integrity of Ukraine by the mere emplacement of such signature on the Ukrainian territory. Overall, the study applies a discursive frame approach developed by Cullen. The collected data is assembled in accordance with five non-exclusive disc discursive frames, which allow to treat semiotic landscapes as an aggregate of discourses. So, for example, I uh, differentiate civic frame, as you can see here, and then commercial frame, which relates more to shops. Yes, this is the overall, um, overall appearance, as you can see in open public spaces. And then third is the Soviet legacy frame, minoritized frame, and commercial frame. Yeah, and transgressive frame. So in sum, this study, um, beyond providing an archive 
offers insights into relations of power, status, and prestige among the languages used in Sevastopol's urban center. In doing so, the study sheds light on the new dominant visibilities amidst gradually fading presences. The linguistic and non-linguistic representations of the Russian nation-state, Russian administrative authorities, political leaders, state actors and in institutions, but also the presence of Soviet monuments and plaques performatively reenact the space of Crimea as Russian and challenge its legal status as a Ukrainian territory. Further, law modalities of science displaying Ukrainian or Crimean Tatar inscriptions uh, add further indexical meanings of non-importance to iconic representations of Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar languages and speakers. Moving on, study two, our nation is just trying to rebirth right now, constructing Crimean Tatar spaces of otherwise through linguistic citizenship, asks in what ways could the suppressed, hidden, and marginalized voices of Crimean Tatar speakers be made visible both discursively and materially? To respond to this question, the study draws on Elizabeth Pavinelli's concept of spaces of otherwise, a concept that captures social space in the making, such as the one that lies in between absence and presence, potentiality and actuality. This study, uh, in uh, comparison to the first study, takes a more ethnographic orientation and it presents an analysis of a walking tour with three young women, Iperi, Edie and Nina. And we start in a um, Crimean Tatar district called Hia Akmechid. Here, this is the district. So, um, as Pavinelli posits, the alternative worlds maintain the otherwise that stares back at us without perhaps being able to speak to us. This sounds like an increasingly abstract def uh, definition. However, it becomes more tangible uh, once study participants enter the field when investigating the familiar Crimean Tatar landscapes. As the study builds on a co-conducted walking tour in the seemingly barren landscape, a space of otherwise, initially invisible and hard to spot, as here, unfolds as it is co-constructed by participants. The participants could articulate this space of otherwise, and by doing so, could make another order of visibility accessible to me. More specifically, during this guided tour through the settlement, the participant interpreted the semiotic landscapes of Akmechid, and by doing so, called Crimean Tatar spaces of otherwise into being. For example, they read and narrated in placed material artifacts, placed semiotics, and gave voice to the absent and yet vibrant legacies of the forcible deportation and return of Crimean Tatars. By doing so, the young women also position themselves as linguistic citizens and indicated ways of seeing otherwise. The landscape stories they were able to tell emphasized the quality of semiotic landscapes to serve as palimpsests with some of their layers only legible to the participants. Familiar with the stories of the Crimean Tatar deportation, return, and ongoing revival, the participants revisited the familiar environs on the tour and made the landscapes speak to more recent political developments. Overall, this study, by investigating the discursive and material phenomena of Crimean Tatar spaces of otherwise, suggests new insights into how silenced pasts re-emerge and can be made legible in the present. As participants show, the absence from semiotic landscapes is only an indication of exclusion from the visuality of conceived space. This exclusion from discourse and materiality of landscape does not mean that something is irreversibly made non-existent or past. In contrast, the alternative social projects keep in reserve the invisible and yet vibrant social phenomena 
oscillating between potentiality and risk. Even when semiotic landscapes and their meanings are erased, they remain bound with people and places. So let's move on to study three, which recently appeared in Linguistic Landscapes Journal. Um, okay, so study three is informed by semiotic landscape scholarship on protest bodies and objects. It draws on semi-structured interviews with two study participants, Nikita and Ali, and 31 visual images from their private archives. So and this study aims to make sense of resistance, which unfolded in response to the Crimean annexation in 2014. Um, and I talked to participants who remember this resistance happen. In particular, I ask how could turbulent protest as an emergent interaction visibilize non-normative orders in an annexed landscape? Instead of foreshadowing what protest is, this study chooses to unsettle the very notion of protest. To do so, it approaches protest as an emergent and turbulent phenomenon accomplished by people and objects in interaction. The post-human theoretical lens I adopt here allows interview and photographic data to be approached with an orientation towards material objects which come to play a pivotal role within protest. By doing so, the study builds on a range of work which demonstrated how the agentive qualities of material objects can create meaning, impact people, and more generally communicate without words. Importantly, protest in the annexed Crimea did not just presume a protesting subject going out on the streets and proclaiming disagreement. The protesting subjects did not have to gather collectively in highly visible and busy sites, nor did they have to declare their disagreement loudly and explicitly. Rather, as one of the participants stated when describing the moments of protest in the occupied Crimea, these were the national flags, <clears throat> the symbolics that fought in the Cold War. The material objects were set to enact protest on par with the individual participants. Combinations of blue and yellow colors, but also forms and fabrics of quotidian objects, such as keychains, backpacks, headdress, pants, and celebratory balloons, were charged with transgressive power as they indexed affiliations with the Ukrainian nation state. These objects, objects placed close or on the protesters' bodies could shout without words and continue the work of resistance in Crimea that was increasingly becoming less free. Overall, this study illuminates that the small acts of uh, protest could disturb the imposed orders and underlining structures of competing nation states. Acts of resistance could cause friction. In this state of flux, the synergies of individuals and objects visualized and brought to the surface otherwise invisible and taken for granted normativities. Things, people, languages, and places could become part of one turbulent ontology, along which the orders on and disorders of the Crimean space were unfolding. In this regard, creative maneuvers could evolve out of an agential interplay of humans and non-humans, and were shown to be indispensable for dissent in this annexed landscape. Lastly, uh, I introduced study four, which asks, how could absence as a materialization of the erasure of Ukrainian statehood from Crimea exert haunting effects on landscapes and individuals' subjectivities? Study four conducts an autoethnographic study of ghosts, specifically out of approximately 3,500 photographs, it takes only 16, 
um, and um, uh, analyzes the data. Um, it takes 16 uh, in four different cities, Simferopol, Sevastopol, Gvardiyska, and Yevpatoria. Um, both captured when walking through the streets, driving in a bus, and attending a museum uh, and another educational institution. So the study analyzes ethnographic data and interrogates shadowy and hold absences as tangible evidence, questions a ghost in an exhibition room, revisits the signs which managed to escape cleansing and examines discursive emissions and material detachments in a museum and in an educational institution. Above all, the study tests the limits of representation and chases down the haunting ghosts reappearing here and there during the ethnographic fieldwork. The paper questions whether attention must be paid to barely present hardly proven phenomena, and whether, whether such phenomena and the processes underscoring them have any material effects. What is in absence, it asks. By looking at manifestations of absence in the public space, the paper goes to the core of the ideological processes of erasure. By interrogating what is no longer there, the study discusses the meanings of the material effects that precede the absences, namely holes in the walls, blankness, detachments, and omissions. In this respect, the concept of trace as the materials of knots of histories at the margins, as well as oratic presences, um, Ado uh, as well as adopted view of empty, sp empty spaces as agentive matter were central. Like previous studies, study four also uses walking, photographing, and note-taking as the main data collection method. However, the ontological status of my body, my memory, and sensing mechanisms differ greatly. For example, not only do I walk along streets, take photographs and visit different places, such as museums. But I'm also engaged in a reflexive practice with myself, the environment, and with the memories and effects that these immaterial, immediate material objects and immaterial traces evoke. By the time I actually narrated my experiences of Ukrainian ghosts making themselves apparent in Crimea, I had conducted a few interviews walking tours, had multiple conversations with various actors, and made notes. In other words, though de relegated to the background, my extensive engagement with the project participants and with the semiotic landscapes across Crimea were co-present when perceiving, sensing, and reading the places of the fieldwork. To summarize the paper four, um, absences are not to be confused with nothing. This is the main argument. Rather, absences and the processes of erasure that brought them about create conditions for new socialities and continue to imbue the erased landscapes with other forms of livelihood. Entangled with my subjectivities, these voids noticeable in centrally located museums, indoor spaces of classrooms and restaurants, busy central streets, remote districts, and abandoned kiosks could become vibrant. Unlike the other studies, this paper contributes to the scholarship interested in body and self-reflexivity. It is a focus on the researchers' embodied experiences of and effective responses to fieldwork spaces that illuminate the intricate relationship between memory, space, landscapes, and the production of situated knowledges. This body and self-centered approach, um, some, some sort of combination of material ethnography with phenomenology, allowed me to conduct a ghost ethnography close attention to an object's affective power and to its evocative effects on human bodies enabled me to capture the absent presences, which, thanks to my mediation, acquired an ability to speak. 
So to summarize all of the four studies, um, all of them investigate semiotic landscapes stretching beyond what is visible and immediately accessible. Absent semiotic landscapes on par with absent absenced people are shown to mutually coexist in the ways they evolve, affect, and change on an ongoing basis. Study one attempts to grasp the visible, yet it becomes alert by what is hardly there. Study two further theoretically unpacks the absenced and nevertheless persistent spaces of otherwise, stretching the temporalities of the present to multiple traumatic pasts and potential futures. Study three eliminates the protesters' engagement with the emerging meanings of science as a way, as a way of maneuvering dissent. And finally, study four positions the researcher's body as a sensing and perceiving mechanism that mediates the effect generated by semiotic landscapes, further unsettling the absencing and haunting in Crimea. In combination, the papers in this thesis show that subjectivity, experience, and thinking are functions of place. As Malpas reminds us, Finding place is thus a matter of finding ourselves, and to find ourselves, we need first to rethink the question of the nature and significance of place. It is not only that human beings impose meaning onto space, rather making sense of human subjectivity and experience means also making sense of place. By extension, if places are fundamental to human experiences, then absence of place is always an absence of an individual's own place. So this, contrib uh, this thesis contributes to the study of absence in semiotic landscapes in three major ways. First, it shows that absence semiotic landscapes are intricately, intricately tied to people. A second contribution is the understanding that the absence of semiotic landscapes from the physical and visual realm of social life does not result in a total disappearance of or avoid. Finally, the third contribution of the thesis is the understanding of semiotic landscapes as temporally dynamic. And I will take just last minutes to expand these three contributions. <clears throat> so first, absence and um, dispossessed semiotic landscapes are intricately, again, intricately tied to people. They mutually constitute each other, and this co-constitution co goes beyond words and voids, that is, behind a highly visible semiotic signature, a barely, not barely noticeable shadow, or the sound of music heard in passing. The interrelationships of people and places are important starting points for in, an investigation of absenced semiotic landscapes. Moreover, if places are considered to be agentive alongside people, as argued in two of the four studies, the constraints of the social may be pushed and the rigid borders between people and places may be rethought. Both human and non-human agencies have the potential to enact so certain social realities. Considering this, a study of semiotic landscapes, as it has been pursued in this thesis, can be taken to offer another lens from which to approach social practice in its material discursive complexity. A second contribution extends the first contribution of this thesis. It is the finding that absence in semiotic landscapes is, on the one hand, an absence from the physical and visual realm of social life. And yet, on the other hand, even when semiotic landscapes and their meanings are erased, they still remain bound with people, places, bodies, memories, and individual subjectivities. In other words, 
Once a sign is erased from the physicality and visuality of a certain landscape, it still remains elsewhere, in discourse, in people's memories, in landscapes of the imagination. This finding supports the idea that absence has to be considered as another layer within the complex historicity of semiotic landscapes and in relation to human others. The contested memories that have, have been made silent, the linguistic signs that have been erased, the material objects or build architecture that have been destroyed, all of these absent semiotic landscapes bear potential to be seen, heard, and reanimated. And finally, the last contribution of this thesis to the study of semiotic landscapes is its conceptualization as temporally dynamic. This temporal dynamism is best captured with an example of a ghost. It may take an individual by surprise, evoke bewilderment, provoke memories, and cause unease. In other words, a ghost is a manifestation of absence that comes to life upon an individual's interrogation of semiotic landscapes. The landscapes may be or may not be as being animated by someone or as themselves provoking this someone. Semiotic landscapes may emerge when participants or researchers engage with them, or they may be silenced and forgotten when such engagement does not take place. They may reappear despite their previous disappearance. As diachronic and layered phenomena, as physical, discursive, and imaginative places bound with individual worlds, semiotic landscapes are evoked from one encounter to the next. Semiotic landscapes are never stable or frozen, but rather changing and inherently in a state of flux. Though constituted by palimpsests, semiotic landscapes retain the dynamism of meanings as they become differently interrogated by various agents calling to the fore their less visible dimensions. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And here is my email. If you'd like to receive a copy of this thesis, you're welcome to contact me.